Okay, good. So, uh, we'll have an introduction. And what I'll be talking to you about is uh, my conceptual framework, uh, the imaging classification that I, I myself have uh, been developing and, and uh, using in our clinical practice. We have a fairly high volume practice for hydrocephalus in the last 10 years or so. It has five different categories. We'll take a closer look at the uh, category three and four before we end. And as I said before, there, there's a problem that there's not a single morphologic pattern of adult hydrocephalus. Here's a picture from uh, one of these Japanese articles from the Symphony study. You can see the pattern that they rely upon where there's high convexity tightness and dilatation of the sylvan fissures, which they call DESH. Uh, but there's not a single pattern that um, has been reported to, uh, to be indicative of uh, adult hydrocephalus. Adult hydrocephalus, by the way, is a term that I think is preferable to normal pressure hydrocephalus because it also encompasses uh, patients who have uh, an intraventricular obstruction. And the patients with intraventricular obstruction can present in the same fashion, essentially. We know from our colleagues in, in Sweden, including Dr. Magnus Tissell uh, in neurosurgery, I think at Gothenburg, that uh, those patients can present in an essentially identical fashion to the patients with a communicating hydrocephalus, and yet the treatment and the diagnosis have to be completely different. So, uh, a woodblock print showing the various different monks feeling the elephant and each coming to a different conclusion uh, in this ukiyo-e print of what they're feeling. So we have to have a common language across a continents, a common uh, language across centers, and this is some attempt to do that. What is hydrocephalus? Uh, well, the, one of the issues for us is that many patients have dilated ventricles in older age, and uh, distinguishing the patients who have dilated ventricles uh, due to hydrocephalus from those who just have dilated ventricles from atrophy or, or other causes is one of the challenges for us. This is the definition of hydrocephalus that uh, we choose from Dr. Howard Cade, a, a uh, neurosurgeon, pediatric neurosurgeon in the States and a mentor of mine, that hydrocephalus is an active distension of the ventricular system from the, uh, the point of production of CSF to the point of resorption. There's some a blockage in that systemic circulation. And if we accept that definition of hydrocephalus, then, as radiologists, uh, we have to realize that the, the, we can make the diagnosis of hydrocephalus uh, if we can establish a point of obstruction. That's different from what uh, many of our, col our clinical colleagues have said, or would have said over the last few years, that the way that you diagnose adult hydrocephalus is by doing a lumbar puncture uh, test and to see, for instance, in American and, and some European centers if the patient gets better, but that really conflates the outcome with the diagnosis. In what other setting would we say that uh, the, if the patient didn't or did get better from treatment for lung cancer, we wouldn't change whether or not we considered them to have that diagnosis, and yet that's been the clinical practice for adult hydrocephalus. If people don't get better from the treatment, they were thought not to have the disease rather than a, a late stage disease, for instance. It's been known for a long time. This is from Dr. Walter Dandy uh, at Johns Hopkins in the 1920s. He started in 1918 and finished his career in the 1940s. Uh, with dye studies in the subarachnoid space, it's been known for a long time that there are points of obstruction in patients with uh, hydrocephalus. And so this is the classification system, which I, I think is a helpful conceptual framework for understanding adult hydrocephalus. We think of uh, type 1 adult hydrocephalus type 1 is being obstruction at the frame of Monroe. Uh, type 2, obstruction between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricular outflow. We can divide that into the two A cases where there's obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct and those uh, two B cases where there's obstruction at the fourth ventricular outflow itself. And so these uh, type 1 and type 2 would be the uh, non-communicating types of hydrocephalus, the cases with intraventricular obstruction. Type 3, these are cases where there's obstruction within the posterior basal cisterns. Uh, type 4, there's a subarachnoid space obstruction above the posterior basal cisterns. And type 5, in our nomenclature, are the cases that are not otherwise specified. We took um, 161 studies that underwent our standard high-resolution clinical uh, hydrocephalus protocol, uh, which we use, incidentally, to uh, ensure that there is patency of the cerebral aqueduct. It, uh, that can be difficult to determine on standard imaging, but um, the patients undergo this before they undergo a large volume lumbar puncture. Uh, 
the, the, the risk of doing a large volume lumbar puncture in a patient who has an aqueductal web, which can be subtle, for instance, which is obstructing the aqueduct, uh, there's potential for brainstem herniation, which is not a, a good thing, although it is rare. So uh, 56 of those patients um, had follow-up exams. Uh, uh, they were uh, undergoing a follow-up exam or were previously treated. 105 were surgically naive. And uh, of those, we looked at um, 89 uh, because of the number of cases that were limited. And so among the 89 cases, I'll, I'll now go through and show you some of the, these different patterns of adult hydrocephalus. In type 1, uh, here are some illustrations made for me by one of our medical illustrators, Lydia Gray. On the left, we have the normal case. The, the green color will be the area proximal to the obstruction. And so as a general rule, uh, we know that the area of the ventricular system where subarachnoids was proximal to the obstruction uh, dilates and that distal to it is small. So if there is obstruction at the foramen of Monroe, the lateral ventricles uh, become big. The third ventricle is small and there's upward bowing, as you can see, of the corpus callosum here. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, these will be all cis images in the sagittal plane, now with half millimeter isotropic resolution, and uh, to look, as I said, specifically at the cervical aqueduct. So uh, in this case, in the age one cases, the, not surprisingly, the lateral ventricles are large. The floor of the lateral ventricles are, are depressed. The roof of the third ventricle is depressed. And, uh, but this is quite rare as a presentation uh, for adult hydrocephalus, only 2% of our sample, but it does occur. The type uh, 2A and 2B cases, this is obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct or obstruction at the fourth ventricular outflow. Uh, here again, the normal case, and this would be a 2A case where there's obstruction at the cerebral aqueduct, and uh, in 2B, the um, obstruction is instead at the fourth ventricular outflow. These uh, are grouped together for reasons which um, I think will become clear by the end of the talk, uh, but uh, it alters the diagnostic and therapeutic regimen. So here's a, a case with AH2A. The patient has uh, a dilated lateral and third ventricles. Notice that the anterior wall of the third ventricle, the lamina terminalis, is bowed anteriorly, the part of the ventricular system proximal to the obstruction uh, when it is uh, uh, possible will dilate into the space distal to the obstruction. And so that's the case here. We have anterior bowing of the lamina terminalis into the cistern of the lamina terminalis, and we have inferior bowing of the floor of the third ventricle into the um, interpedicular and, and uh, supracellular systems. Here the aqueduct is, uh, is small by definition at its minimal point, and you can see in fact multiple different uh, thin webs obstructing the cerebral aqueduct uh, of course, sometimes there are masses which uh, are quite large obstructing the cerebral aqueduct, but uh, you can have aqueductal obstruction due to very fine webs that uh, can be less than, um, yeah, certainly less than a millimeter in thickness. So this is a relative contraindication to lumbar puncture, as I mentioned. It's dangerous for these patients to undergo lumbar puncture. And this was uh, comparatively more common in our sample than reported previously in the literature, 21%. And uh, here's a woman who had uh, the, presented with a typical triad of symptoms, and she has a mass, you'll notice, in the cerebral aqueduct here. And uh, if you look at the extent to which the floor of her third ventricle is depressed, not surprisingly, and it goes without saying, here's the lamina terminalis being displaced anteriorly, the mass. It goes without saying that she does not have, should not have, and does not have the dash pattern. Look at the sylvian fissures, they're very tiny here. The area over the convexities is small. And note also in the sagittal cyst image that the interhemispheric fissure is relatively normal in appearance. In the age three cases, here's the normal case. And uh, now the, there is a communicating hydrocephalus. The CSF gets out into the subarachnoid space, but the obstruction is in the posterior basal cisterns. And uh, so here we have some point of obstruction ventral to the brainstem. And here is such a case. So in these age three cases, in, the, in looking at the uh, morphology, uh, we might expect, if we look just at the lamina terminalis and the floor of the third ventricle, uh, because the lateral and third ventricles are enlarged, and there's anterior bowing of the uh, lamina terminalis and downward bowing of the floor of the third ventricle, this mimics uh, quite well, in some sense, uh, cases of aqueductal stenosis or fourth ventricular outflow obstruction. And yet you can see on this anatomic image, 
that uh, the aqueduct is patent and the fourth, ventricle, uh, fourth ventricular outflow is also patent. This is not a case of obstructive hydrocephalus. Here in the coronal reconstruction through the, the basal cisterns, uh, in these cases, you can see that there are frequently these membranes ventral to the pons. I'll come back to that in a, a few minutes, uh, but the question is what are those membranes and what accounts for this uh, morphologic pattern of hydrocephalus? So this was about 10% of our sample. And again, here's an axial reconstruction through the pons. Here's uh, a membrane ventral to the basilar artery where there should not be any normal anatomic structure. And the question is, what is that in the coronal plane? Uh, noting a little bit anteriorly, here is, uh, by the way, the cisternal segment of the abducens nerve that we talked about um, this morning, lateral to that membrane. Here, uh, moving on to the next category, AH4. We have on the left-hand side the normal case, on the right-hand side, these are patients where there appears to be some obstruction in the interhemispheric fissure between the hemispheres. And uh, here is such a case, an AH4 case. Notice uh, here that the lateral and third ventricles are again enlarged. There's no, however, anterior bowing of the lamina ter terminalis or downward bowing of the floor of the third ventricle. This is a normal third ventricular morphology. And yet, uh, note the, these loculations or honeycombing appearance in the interhemispheric fissure. We can begin to see this with high resolution imaging. Uh, it's uh, certainly present in many of the cases that were scanned previously, but uh, you need a higher spatial resolution to be able to detect changes uh, like these in the subarachnoid space. This was about a third of our sample. Here on the left hand side is a, a patient with AH4. Again, note the honeycombing, the loculation in the interhemispheric fissure who improved after a shunt. A 68-year-old patient on the right also with uh, that same sort of honeycombed appearance, uh, potentially loculated appearance who improved after shunt as well. Uh, the last case, these are patients who we presume have some other impediment to CSF flow, but on MRI we don't see a point of obstruction. So contrast in your mind the interhemispheric fissure here to that in AH4. And look how bland this is. There is not, it is not the case that there is honeycombing in the interhemispheric fissure. That's what the normal subarachnoid space ought to look like. And um, these patients don't uh, otherwise, uh, it, we don't see a point of obstruction in these cases. That's a, still about a third of our sample. This was a 70 year old patient with no improvement after drainage who was ultimately diagnosed not with hydrocephalus but with frontotemporal dementia. But as a cautionary note, I should point out that here is a 75 year old woman who also fits in our, the same category, the age five category. Uh, who did improve after shun. So if we go back now and we talk a little bit about more about the, the third uh, category in my um, the conceptual framework that I'm presenting to you, these are patients with a posterior basal cisternal obstruction. And uh, the question again was, what is this membrane eventual to the pons? And uh, let me share with you what I think that is. So here, in the axial plane again, in the coronal plane, we can see the same membrane with the abducens nerve lateral to it. Now, this is a dissection specimen from when I, I was teaching, when I teach neuroanatomy. And uh, here, of course, you see the basilar artery. And this is that uh, a structure, an anatomic structure, one which we may not be used to thinking about in radiology. This is called the anterior palatine membrane. Now here's another image where I'm holding the, the brain stem. You can see it off to one side and pulling it out just a little bit. So here in a diagram by uh, Matsuno and Rotan uh, in the neurosurgical literature, you can see the, the typical anatomy of the subarachnoid space. We tend to think of the subarachnoid space as being uh, diffusely uh, in communication, but in fact there are typical anatomic structures of the subarachnoid space which are not uh, generally uh, looked at in, in radiology. So this membrane here, separating the prepontine cistern around the basilar artery medially from the cerebellopontine cistern laterally, that's the anterior pontine membrane, the same structure which I've just shown you anatomically. Here's a figure by Wolfgang Seeger, a German neurosurgeon, again showing uh, the anterior pontine membrane here separating the prepontine cistern from the cerebellopontine cistern laterally. And in Seeger's work, you can see, and I think this is important, that ordinarily there is transitive CSF in the uh, transverse plane between the prepontine and cerebellopontine cisterns. 
Uh, Seeger, by the way, uh, has one anatomic inaccuracy in his uh, figure here. The sixth cranial nerve, and I think this is important, uh, passes lateral to, not medial to, the anterior pontine membrane. Look as well at the superior aspect of the prepontine cistern. You can see that this membrane is uh, Lilliquist, the membrane of Lilliquist, described by Bent Lilliquist in the 1950s. And there's normally a gap uh, that allows for uh, potentially transit of CSF between the posterior fossa through the uh, tentorial and caesura uh, ventrally. This is the gap in the membrane of Lilliquist. And we think that, we don't have, uh, surprisingly, in, in this age, uh, we still don't know much about the uh, flow of CSF. It's even debated whether or not there is a flow of CSF, although I, I certainly think that there is. And, uh, but this is a gap in the membrane of Lilliquist, which potentially allows for uh, communication between the infratentorial and supratentorial uh, uh, sites. Here again, diagrammatically, uh, the red dotted line indicates this ventral view of the brain stem again from Matsuno and Rotan. The uh, distinction between the prepontine cistern in blue medially from the cerebellopontine cistern laterally in orange. And uh, notice in uh, Matsuno and Rotan, here is the basilar artery, obviously, in the prepontine cistern, that the six cranial nerves, the cisternal segments of the six cranial nerves that we talked about this morning, they are lateral to the anterior pontine membrane. Here's a normal case. We do, um, we've done well over 2,000 skull base MRIs. I, I talked to you some about the cranial nerves on skull base MRI this morning, but we do it for multiple indications. And so here's a normal, someone with no uh, abnormality, no hydrocephalus uh, for comparison. And what you can see here in the axial view is this is the basilar artery, and here it is in the coronal reconstruction of the same acquisition. And uh, here are the six cranial nerves, the cisternal segments of the six cranial nerves, and they are lateral to these membranes on either side of the basilar artery. Those, again, are the anterior pontine membranes. And that's a normal view of the anterior pontine membrane. Here they are in the coronal view. So this is the prepontine cistern in blue, and this in orange is the cerebellopontine cistern. Well, what is AH3 then? And uh, what I think AH3 reflects, this posterior basal cisternal obstruction, uh, is here's the basal artery. The basal artery uh, is uh, medial to these membranes. The membranes are uh, opposed at the midline where they should not be, and the prepontine cistern is just that blue area. These are the cerebellopontine cisterns meeting at the midline that should not meet at the midline. And so in the uh, coronal view, these are the cerebellopontine cisterns expanded and meeting at the midline. Here's the cisternal segment of six. And so this is, uh, I would uh, say, an analog of uh, something we're more familiar with, but just in an area where we haven't had the spatial resolution to understand the pathophysiology of disease as well. This is an analog of aqueductal stenosis, but in the subarachnoid space. It's outside of the ventricular system, and yet it's also a, a narrowing, a stenosis in a structure which should look widely patent, as it does on the right side, uh, but is uh, pathologically uh, stenosed due to uh, pathologic uh, ex uh, expansion of the cerebellopontine cisterns, which meet at the midline, and the anterior membranes are the are uh, opposed in forming that membrane ventral to the pons. Now, occasionally when I pass by the MRI and I catch, uh, I can catch one of these patients on the scanner, I'll sit down and scan myself. Here's such a patient where the anterior membranes are not easily seen in this image, but here's the basilar artery on the left, the cyst image on the right, the, the cardiac gated phase contrast imaging and uh, the anterior membranes here are displaced medially, you might think, based on the standard axial T2-weighted image, that there would be CSF flow ventral to caudal through that entire fluid-filled space. And yet, it's not the case. We can see on the cardiac gated phase contrast imaging now that there is biphasic flow as I go through here, just in that now constricted area, right around the basilar artery, right in the prepontine cistern. Uh, we think that that reflects the major uh, outflow tract of the posterior fossa. Now, the, in uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, it's actually been reported, perhaps not surprisingly, that uh, uh, patients um, with thickened uh, membrane of Lilliquist uh, did better after uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy bypassing a, an obstruction in this area. And they found uh, in this study by Etis and all, a fibroblast-like cells uh, 
um, in chronic cases, and none of these patients had a history of hemorrhage or infection, and yet they had pathologic thickening of uh, the, the arachnoidal septae in the posterior fossa. So what is H3? We think it's an obstruction here in the posterior basal cisterns. If we look further at these age 4 cases with uh, areas of potential loculation in the interhemispheric fissure, but normal uh, third ventricular morphology, uh, they will have tight, high convexities. Look at the prepontine cistern here in this case compared to the H3 cases, by the way. You don't see that same membrane of the apposition of the interpontine membranes at the midline. These patients have a widened sylvian fissure, and here Again, uh, this is uh, me scanning a patient uh, I happen to catch on the scanner. Normally, we just go through the midline through the aqueduct, uh, but I noticed this patient had what the Japanese would call DESH and what I would call AH4. And when I scan through the sylvian fissures in these patients, we see the same honeycombing, the same loculation, areas of, of uh, hyperintense CSF and, uh, in, and uh, septate between them that we see in the interhemispheric fissure, but in, within the sylvian fissures. And so, uh, our um, hypothesis is that the Japanese uh, description of adult hydrocephalus principally describes this AH4 uh, entity. Here, by the way, uh, is a look at the high convexities. In AH1, that's the foramen of Monroe stenosis, there are tight high convexities, not surprisingly perhaps. In AH4, where we have loculation of the interhemispheric fissure and perhaps much of, more of the subarachnoid space in the supratentorial compartment, you have these areas where the subarachnoid space is tight and other areas where there is pooling of CSF within the cell site. And in AH5, a more balanced uh, view, a more balanced appearance of the subarachnoid space. So in conclusion, um, the, uh, I haven't described it here, but we also did a, a study. I took it out because of, I'm sorry, I didn't think we had enough time. But I, I will tell you that we've um, now looked retrospectively at uh, the cases that would meet the Japanese criteria of DASH and those without DASH, and the outcomes were equivalent, essentially. There's no uh, difference in prognosis. So how could we um, use this sort of classification system uh, clinically? The AH2 cases, the aqueductal stenosis cases, should not be diagnosed with a lumbar puncture. They should be uh, treated potentially with endoscopic third ventriculostomy. What about the AH3 cases? Those are the people with the posterior basal cisternal obstruction. Uh, these patients can be diagnosed with a lumbar puncture. And potentially, though, they can also be treated with endoscopic third ventriculostomy. The patients with AH4 uh, can undergo our, our standard clinical assessment with lumbar puncture and ventricular perineal shunt, uh, resulting if the patients improve after lumbar puncture. And the same thing with the AH5 cases. Just a word or two on preoperative imaging for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. I don't know how commonly this is performed at your centers, uh, but we know that uh, high resolution imaging will also sometimes reveal relative contraindications to endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy, for those who are not familiar with this procedure, is one where the neurosurgeon passes an endoscope through the lateral ventricle, through the frame of Monroe and then pierces the floor of the third ventricle in order to uh, create a bypass of an obstruction either in the ventricular system or in the low um, cisterns of the subarachnoid space. So here is a sagittal image on a patient who um, happened to have, uh, this is the, in fact, the tip of the basilar artery here right against the floor of the third ventricle, a relative contraindication to endoscopic third ventriculostomy, perhaps depending on its location, an absolute contraindication to third ventriculostomy because the surgeon will sometimes pass the, uh, sometimes the floor of the third ventricle is translucent, they can see through it, at other times it's opaque and they're passing uh, a trocar blindly through the floor of the third ventricle. We want to make sure that we keep them out of trouble uh, and tell them about this anatomy. Here's another case, uh, this uh, a, a child with um, an abnormal morphology, obviously the ventricular system, but the uh, foramen of Monroe uh, appeared to be uh, patent, or at least it wasn't clearly pathologic on standard imaging. We did high resolution imaging, and on the high resolution study, you can see there's uh, incidentally perforation of the septum pellucidum here in the coronal plane, but the foramen of Monroe was obstructed on both sides. This um, is a relative contraindication to endoscopic third ventriculostomy. It, the uh, ETV was still performed in this case, and, and the patient had a good outcome, but it, the uh, results can be uh, less 
uh, positive for the patients, if, uh, particularly if the fornices are interrupted. So how could uh, this uh, scheme again be put into clinical practice? First, the patients get an MRI, and uh, we divide the patients into whether or not they have uh, age one or two, uh, compared to age three, four, or five. If they have um, type one, a foramen of Monroe stenosis, the patient should go directly to surgery. No further uh, testing is, is really possible. If they have age two, and by surgery here I mean ventricular peritoneal shunting typically, uh, or occasionally opening up of the foramen of Monroe. And uh, for age two, these are the patients with aqueductal stenosis or fourth ventricular outflow obstruction. Those patients should, uh, can potentially benefit from endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is uh, preferable to having a ventricular perineal shunt, we know that the failure rate of ventricular perineal shunting is uh, still in this day and age relatively high over five years, and the patients uh, have to undergo uh, lots of additional diagnostic testing sometimes. So if the patient can get an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, sometimes they will do well with that. AH3, 4, or 5, the patients will undergo at our center lumbar puncture, and, and if there's an ambiguous result, a large volume extended lumbar drainage. If they have AH3, and they improve, then the patient can be tried to undergo an endoscopic third ventriculostomy because that should bypass the obstruction in the posterior basal cisterns. If they have age four or five, this is uh, either a block in the interhemispheric fissure where we don't see an obstruction. The patient uh, should uh, likely go directly for ventricular peritoneal shunting. And of course, if they fail endoscopic third ventriculostomy, then ventricular peritoneal shunting can still be uh, approach can still be an option for the patient. So this again is um, conceptually how uh, I would uh, offer a, a means of, of thinking about these cases, patients with adult hydrocephalus, and again one of the only reversible causes of dementia in our aging population, in that if we uh, pay attention to these various patterns of adult hydrocephalus, we have the potential to help more patients than if we only identify uh, one single uh, pattern. If we uh, work towards, as a community of uh, neuroradiologists worldwide, a single shared nomenclature, I think this would be helpful. And um, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators in this field. On the left-hand side is uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. David Solomon from Neurology, who unfortunately has passed away in this last year. Uh, in the center, Dr. Daniele Rigamonti, uh, who is the, was a neurosurgeon in our group, who's now leading the Johns Hopkins effort as CEO of Johns Hopkins Saudi Arabia Aramco. Uh, and here's Dr. Abhe Mokikar from Neurology. Dr. M Mark Luciano is our current uh, neurosurgeon, and uh, Dr. Jehun Shin and uh, Dr. Kareem Ahmed are two uh, medical students I've worked with. So uh, thank you, Dr. Elish and, and Dr. Eliyahu. I appreciate your attention to the audience, and thank you for the invitation.